at tonight to our study of the Psalms. The Psalms have been called the little Bible. Any subject you can find in the rest of the Bible, you can find in the Psalms. The Psalms talk about creation. They talk about the law of Moses. They give you history of Israel right up to the time of the writing of the Psalms. And then it talks about the Messiah. Many Psalms are what we call Messianic Psalms. They're prophecies about the Lord Jesus Christ coming. Many of the Psalms are about the future, future for Israel, future in heaven. Many Psalms contain great prophecies in them. They're just filled with everything you'd find the rest of the Bible in the book of Psalms. It's a great book. Many people love to study it. I suppose the biggest book written on the Psalms is by Charles Hatton Spurgeon. Six volumes, which I have in my library, have copies that were made in the 1800s, given to me by uh, some of my family, and that was copies made at the time he was pastoring the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, England. And so they are just very, very amazing. The things that Charles Hatton Spurgeon could glean from the Psalms, I would have never thought of in a hundred years. That man had a mind, a fantastic mind. He was called the Prince of Preachers, and certainly he was. I don't know, probably a million preachers have gained from Charles Hatton Spurgeon since he lived. He's been a real tremendous influence on the life of true Bible believers, true Bible preachers. I suppose most preachers have books from him in their library, as I also do. Anyway, he loved the Psalms, and we ought to love the Psalms. There's great teaching in them for us. Tonight is an interesting psalm. Psalm chapter 37 gives us blessings for the saved, but cursings for the lost. It contrasts God's people with the world and lost people. A lot of contrasts in this big, long chapter. Now, I know it's 40 verses long. You say, Pastor, we're also having communion. You know, we usually eat after church, so we don't want to go too long now. Well, we won't. We'll just glean over some of the verses here. We can't do justice to this whole chapter tonight. But we'll give you four different points. You know, one of the evidences of God's word being God's word is the way it's constructed too. This particular psalm, every fourth line of it in Hebrew, it was written in Hebrew, every fourth line of it is a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It goes through the whole Hebrew alphabet in every fourth verse of this, particular of this particular chapter. Very interesting. And so God put this together, not man. It's amazingly put together. Psalm 37. Well, there's four big points here we can give you if you want to take down points. Point number one, exhortations to the righteous. That's found in verses 1 through 11, and they are great ones. There's some good things here. In fact, if people read this particular chapter outside of verse 23, probably the first 11 verses are what most people hold to and claim as promises. They're great, great promises for us. But then the second place tonight, the disappointments and destruction of the wicked. That will be in verses 12 to 20, contrasting what he says about saved people in verses 1 to 11. Thirdly, we'll look at the enrichment of righteous people in verses 21 to 31. Finally, the end of a righteous man versus the end of a wicked man in verses 32 through 40. So those are the four great points we can find in Psalm 37. Point number one, exhortations to the righteous. Look at the first one in verse number one. Fret not thyself because of evildoers. 
That's the first thing we cannot do. Let me tell you, folk, there are evil doers everywhere. And there are Christians that worry themselves sick over evil doers, over men that do wrong things, over the sin that's in the world. Certainly it should upset us and concern us, but don't fret over it. You know, God's in control no matter how bad things get. God knows all about it. In the scriptures it says, evil men will wax worse and worse. That's what it says. In the last days, perilous times shall come, and we're there. So the Bible predicts the kind of day and age that we're in. You look at all the evil around you, you could make yourself sick about it. But don't. Don't fret yourself over evildoers. Now that doesn't mean don't be concerned. Don't do what we can to be salt and light in this world. We still need to stand for righteousness. And in a country like the United States of America, we have freedom of speech. We ought to speak up all that we can, even though that freedom of speech is being trodden on this day and time. When you want to say things the Bible says, oh, we don't want that in public places now. Be careful where you say it, you know. Oh, don't say anything the Bible says about sinfulness like homosexuality and stuff like that. Oh, no, 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 don't say that. Mm -hmm. Freedom of speech. It's really out there really out there. But anyway, don't fret yourself because of evildoers. Also, don't be envious against the workers of iniquity. Now, why would you be envious of them? Well, it seems like people can do all kinds of wicked things and get away with it. Somebody told me recently, said, you know, you preached against, you've preached against smoking sometimes. And of course, smoking isn't good for you because it's been proven that it's harmful to your bodies and your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But the person telling me that said, I know somebody that lived to be 85 and smoked cigarettes every day. I know somebody else that lived to be, you know, and they try to give exceptions to the rule of what happens to most people. And I think the reason they do that is to justify the fact, well, you know, if God allowed them to live so long doing something wrong... He might allow me to live so long. You know, that's being presumptuous. The Bible says, uh, David prayed, keep me from presumptuous sins. You know, thinking, well, God is letting people get by with their sins, so he's going to let me get by with mine too. You may be the person he cuts off. God says the wicked will soon be cut off. And so we better listen to that, Proverbs 29.1. God isn't mocked. What people sow, they're going to reap eventually. It will catch up with them. Don't be envious of wicked people. Don't be jealous of their life and the way that they live. Notice verse 2 tells you what's going to happen. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Grass is cut down quickly. And boy, mine gets tall. I'm glad to run that mower through it. It is so satisfying to get done mowing the yard and it looks so much better. It doesn't take long and the grass is mowed down. God says in the book of James that our life is like grass that appear for a little while and withereth away. Folk, when God looks at things and put things in the Bible, he weighs them in light of eternity, which has no beginning and no ending. So when we look at it, say, oh, a wicked man's getting away with things 50, 60 years. This isn't right. Well, it's nothing in God's sight. A thousand years are like one day to him, it says in 2 Peter 3, 8. And one day is a thousand years. Time's nothing to God. When God says they'll soon be cut down in light of eternity, they'll soon be cut down just like grass. Psh, it's going to be it for them. And that's sad. People ought to wake up. They're not getting away with anything God said plainly in Numbers 32, 23. Be sure, be sure, write it down, mark it down. You can be positive. Your sin will find you out. You will not get away with it. You may think that you have. Maybe there's some sin way back there that nobody knows about. You think you've gotten away with it. God saw it. 
God says when he judges us, he opens books. The books are open. And people are judged out of them. He has a record of our life. People want to forget God. Think what they get away with in this life. But it doesn't work. God says the wicked will soon be cut down. So don't envy them. Don't fret yourself because of them. Instead of that, verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land and verily thou shalt be fed. People who trust in the Lord, have faith in the Lord, follow the Lord, have a great future. Here he says you'll dwell in the land. Now remember, the primary audience of the writings here in this psalm is attributed to David, as you see. Primary audience would be Israelites, Jews. In the Old Testament, their great future is predicted as dwelling in their land with the Lord ruling over them. We know it from the New Testament as being the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign of Christ on this earth. Now, of course, does that mean that Jews and Israelites have no future in heaven? Oh, no, no, no. But God in the Old Testament promised them a land. In fact, the borders of it are given in Deuteronomy that they've never had. All the way from the river of Egypt, which would be the Nile River, all the way to the Euphrates River, which is way over past Saudi Arabia into the country of Iraq. From the Nile River to Iraq, all the way north to Syria and the Mediterranean Sea. Wow, that's a big land area. They've never had all that land yet. But in the future, trust in the Lord, my people. You're going to inherit all of that land in the future. He's got a tremendous land for them. Well, we have a better land than that, do we not? We have a land called heaven. Literally, our dwelling place is in the heavenly New Jerusalem. What's it like? Revelation 21 and 22 tell you. Beautiful place beyond our comprehension, really. I cannot imagine a place that's totally light. Even in here tonight, we say we got the lights on, but they're shadows. There are places in here that are darker than... A, I can't imagine pure light. Can you? I mean, pure light. I have been in pure darkness, and let me tell you, that's scary. I was in an iron ore mine in northern Michigan as a teenager years ago. We went down in this mine, cool in there, damp in there. They had lights running along the wall, and the guide said, Now stop dead still. And we did. He says, I'm turning the lights off. See how it feels. He turned the lights off. And I remember putting my hand in front of my face, (laughs) feeling it, but I couldn't see it at all. It was an eeriness that is just amazing. Pure darkness is scary. Well, pure light's just the opposite. It will be bright. The heavenly Jerusalem is filled with the glory of God totally bright. It's so bright that we in our human bodies couldn't dwell there. What happens to a human being if he sees God in his glory? You're consumed. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, 23, God is a consuming fire. We cannot see God and live. No man has seen God at any time, it says in James 1, 18. You can't see God and live. Remember Moses wanted to see God? Oh, God, just show me. I just want to see you. God said, Moses, go into a cave. Inside that dark cave, I'll just show you my backside. That was unbelievably bright. He couldn't hardly stand that much of God. That's what lights in that land we're going to inherit in the future, folk. Heavenly New Jerusalem, where God dwells. Hallelujah. Trust in the Lord. Do good, live a good life. It's worth it in the end as compared to those who don't. It's worth it. Let's move on. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Have you ever heard somebody say, God will meet your needs, not your wants? That was told me yesterday in the prayer breakfast by someone. And it certainly is true. God meets our needs. He promised that, did he not? 
Philippians 4, 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now watch that. It's God supplying our needs. So just a word there. He knows what you need better than you do. Sometimes we think we need this when God knows we need something else. He'll supply our need, and that need will be what's best for us because he works all things together for our good. But did you read this verse carefully? Does it say the Lord's just going to give us the needs of our life? No, it says delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you desires. He'll meet wants that you have. Now again, let's qualify that. God certainly wants to give you desires, but sometimes he kind of changes our desires so that we'll desire the right things. That happened to me when it comes to being a preacher. I did not go away to college to be a preacher. My dad was a preacher. I said, not for me. I'm going to go to college and study something else. I started out studying out to started out to study being a history teacher. I said I'll be a history teacher. But the Lord got a hold of me through a whole series of things I won't go through tonight. And by my second year of college, he was really working on my heart, and he put in my heart 1 Timothy 3:1. He that desireth the office of a bishop desireth a good thing. He changed my wants to want to be a preacher. I can't explain it, but my heart wants changed. And when he changed that, he gave it to me. God sometimes changes our desires, and then he fulfills those particular desires. But, oh, don't think that God's only going to give you your needs God can also supply desires and wants. Only just like with needs, with wants, he could change some things around there in our life. But delight yourself in the Lord. He's going to bless you if you do that. Look at the next one. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. You want to see something happen in your life, a great decision you want to have answered and met and taken care of? Well, it tells you the conditions. Commit your way unto the Lord and trust in him again. Have faith in him. Absolutely say, Lord, you know what you want for me in this particular aspect. I'm going to totally do what you want me to do now. I'm going to do it. And then have faith that God is going to carry it through. Oh, is he a, is a, he a great God when you commit your way unto him? Um, Hudson Taylor was a great preacher in China, missionary to China. He says, attempt great things for God and expect great things from God. You commit your way to the Lord and go out to do things for him, expect God is going to do great things through you. So this verse is what God wants us to do. He shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, thy judgment as the noonday. God absolutely will bless us if we will follow him. Now here's a tough one in verse 7, I suppose. This is a hard one. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. I wish thought that part was not there. I'd love to rest in the Lord, but I don't like to wait. I like to get answers right away. I like to know what's going to happen. I like to know what to do now. And there's some things on the table in my life right now. I wish I had the answer today. I wish I had the answer tonight for it, but I don't. So what have I got to do? Wait patiently on the Lord. Folk, when God says he works all things together for our good, remember this. He works things together for our good in his time. He knows the best time for things to happen in our life to fulfill his promise to us. Sometimes we think right now is when we need this. 
Right now, we got to be shown which direction to go, but God doesn't always do it right now. He wants you to wait upon him. Have patience. If you'll wait upon the Lord, fret not yourself because of him that prospereth in his way because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. No, don't be worried about the wicked people and what they're doing. You concentrate on the Lord. You rest in him. He will bring the things to pass he wants in your life. And let me tell you, when God does something for you and you see it, there's no satisfaction and blessing to your soul like that. When you connive around to get things what you want your way, instead of waiting on God and let him do it his way, it won't bring satisfaction to you. You won't be happy when you try to force the Lord about things. Wait on him. He gives you the best things in the best time. You know, thinking about Israel themselves, Israel's last prophet from God was around 400 B.C., his name Malachi. After Malachi, a hundred years went by, no prophet from the Lord. I'm sure Israel was saying, what's happened? Has God ceased to talk to us? Man, Malachi talks about the Messiah too, and where is he? 300 B.C., 250 B.C., no prophet, no Messiah. 200 B.C., no prophet, no Messiah. Boy, they just can't quite understand this. So by the time they get down to 150 B.C., they say, we've got to take things in our own hands. The Romans, the Syrians, they're all giving us problems, and so... Mr. Maccabees claimed to be a deliverer, a Messiah. And he came along and rebelled against the Romans and the Syrians and led the Jews in some victorious times. But ultimately, they were defeated and totally conquered by the Romans who set up, of course, their province under their total control at that particular time. They thought they would run ahead of God God's not speaking to us. God's not giving us the Messiah. We got to have deliverance or we got to have it now. And they took things in their own hands and blew it. God knew when he wanted the Messiah to come after 400 years of that last prophet Malachi. Then the Messiah was coming, but he didn't come the way that they thought he would come. He didn't come with pomp and circumstance. He didn't come blowing trumpets and say, here I am, I'm overthrowing the Roman government, I'm going to give you Jews a kingdom, here I am. No. He came as a little baby, born in a stable, in the city of Bethlehem, a little town. Not even Jerusalem, where the king ought to be born in the mind of the Jews. Bethlehem. So you know, he didn't come like they expected when they saw Jesus and the miracles he did, they thought, well, maybe he is the Messiah. But when he rode into Jerusalem on the donkeys on Palm Sunday, and they thought, here it is. He's finally going to overthrow Pilate and the Roman government. They threw branches in the way. Hosanna to him that cometh in the name of the Lord. And he enters Jerusalem and he doesn't overthrow Pilate. No. They're totally disillusioned. So that just four or five days, depending, I'm going to get in the big debate on when Jesus was definitely crucified. But anyway, four or five days after they cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he that come in the name of the Lord. They're crying out, crucify him, crucify him. The same crowd. Because they said, no, he's not our Messiah. He's not doing what we expect him to do. He's not our Messiah. And they rejected him. But of course, they missed the boat. If they'd read their Old Testament prophets, they would know the Messiah would come in as a man who's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. That's Isaiah 53. A man who came to take away our sins. All we like sheep have gone astray, Isaiah said. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Let me tell you something. 
if the Messiah had come, overthrown the Roman government, and set up his own kingdom, it would not have done them any good because sin would still be on the throne of men's hearts. The big thing God had to take care of is man's sin problem. And the Messiah came into the world to do that the first time. He is coming back the second time to rule and reign as the Jews thought he would the first time. He'll be doing that the second time for sure. But folk, commit your way to the Lord. Rest in him because God does things the best way at the proper time. Trusting. And God will bring the things to pass that's best for you. Here's another encouragement. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Isn't it easy to get angry? I've heard some people say to me, Pastor, the things going on in our world just plain make me mad. Well, I suppose they're talking about righteous indignation. I'm sure the things going on in the world make God mad too. But I hope it doesn't make you so mad that you go around and try to change things yourself. Shoot up people, stuff like that, that folk try to do to get things changed. That's the wrong way to go. We don't do things in anger. Cease from anger, forsake wrath. Verse 9 says, For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, and thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. Now notice God says a little while. Man, Lord, do you realize it's been 2,000 years since Jesus was here? Isn't that getting a little long? To God, it's nothing. It's just a little while. He says you're just going to have to be patient a little while, and those wicked people that rule in our world will be no more. They will be gone. Righteousness is going to rule in this world in the future, folk, when Jesus Christ comes to rule and reign. It will be here. And when righteousness rules, it will then start ruling forever. It will last forever. So we just got to wait for now. And don't get all upset about the people in the world. Verse 11 the wicked shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. What's a meek person? Someone who knows the truth but doesn't throw it around like they're the smart Alex. Someone who has plenty of power and authority but doesn't say, you better listen to me or else. No, it's someone who has those things but they keep themselves under control. Like Jesus. The Bible calls Jesus meek and lowly. That doesn't mean he was a weak person. Jesus was the son of God, and he could have at any time decided, I'm done with this world. I'm wiping these wicked people out. I'm tired. He could have done that. He told Pilate he could call <clears throat> 10 legions of angels and deliver him from Pilate. He wouldn't have needed 10 legions. Just one angel killed 185,000 Midianites in the Old Testament. Remember that? All he would have had to have is one angel to deliver him from Pilate. But nonetheless, his point is, I have all power. All power is given to me in heaven and earth. Matthew 28, 18. But yet, he kept it under control in order to accomplish the purposes of God in this world. We may have rights. We may have the right to say this, the right to do that, the right, right, right. However, we need to keep it under control for God to work and move in the way that he wants to. Don't necessarily throw your power around, your authority around. Make sure you do what God wants you to do with it. The meek will inherit the earth and delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Well, as we move on along through here now, <clears throat> come to our second big point, and we'll be going faster along through here. The disappointments and destruction of the wicked. Look at verse 12 through verse 21. Just look at a few of these a moment. The wicked plotteth against the just 
and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. Could we not say that's really getting this that way in our day and time? The wicked out there can't stand righteous people saying, you know, where's the Ten Commandments? We ought to follow them. Take them out of schools today. We can't have them influencing our kids. <laughs> that's exactly what the Supreme Court of Kentucky said. <clears throat> When they made Kentucky public schools take the Ten Commandments out of their schools, here's what the justices said. If the Ten Commandments hang in the hallways, it'll influence the children to do what they say, and that would be religious, and we can't have that. What stupidity. So instead of that, kids do all kinds of wrong things in the school because they have no standard of right or wrong. Whatever men think is right or wrong, that's their standard, and that is so inconsistent of what men think is right and wrong. It's a mess out there in society. But you see, the wicked plotteth against the just. They gnash upon them with their teeth. Oh, I can't stand them. I just, oh, I'd like to kill every righteous man I can, some of them think. Just get rid of them in Washington, D.C. Get rid of all the people who want to do righteousness. Just let us have our way up there and run this country according to socialism and letting everybody do what's right in his own eyes and we'll have a great society. Yeah. There's been other countries that have tried it and ruined themselves. We're going the direction of communist Russia. No God the government does everything for you. Take from the rich and give to the poor so everybody's equal out there. Communism. Can I ask you, has communism benefited anybody where it is? No. It's a shame that people can't see it. But anyway, the wicked plot against the just. But look at verse 13. The Lord shall laugh at him for he seeth that his day is coming. Isn't that quite a statement? God laughs at people. It's over in Psalm 2. We studied Psalm 2 already. Remember what God said in Psalm 2? Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder, cast away their cords from us. We're getting rid of God. We're getting rid of all God's commandments. We're getting rid of all God's ways. We can't stand them. We don't want them. We'll look at verse 4 of Psalm 2. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord will have them in derision. Folk, it's a laugh like this. Not that God is happy with what they're doing. His laugh is a mocking of them. <laughs> Those people think they can throw off my bands. They think they can escape my judgment. Ha, ha, you just wait. That's what God is saying in our verse here in Psalm chapter number 37. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. God sees the end of all the wicked people. And it's not that he laughs when he has to judge them. He's saying it's just absolutely ridiculous that wicked men think they can throw off God. God got judgment coming for them and they better wake up. God says he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So it's not like he's going to cast somebody into hell and laugh about it. No, 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 no. What we're saying is God is just absolutely telling mankind it is stupid what you're doing to throw me off and forget me. You can't do it. You're going to face my judgment. That's what God is saying here. He goes on down through here, and we don't have a lot of time to look at all these verses right here. I like verse 16. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. Boy, people today think the key thing is money. If I can just have a big bunch of money, when I get older, I'm going to really enjoy it and just live it up. And you know, some people do. They lay up abundance for themselves, retire. They can buy themselves a million-dollar place out on some island and go out there and just enjoy it. We see it sometimes on HGTV. 
I've seen a couple times buying a whole island. People can buy their own islands today. Did you know that? Now, some people buy them in the middle of Canada in a cold old lake up there. They buy a cabin. Don't think they'd spend the winter there, but anyway, they buy a cabin. They have it made, but wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, you might enjoy it 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, but sometime you're going to die. And if all you did was put everything into this life, you're going to be a big loser. The Lord says very plainly, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where rust and moth doth corrupt and men break through and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. You have them to enjoy forever. No, I'm not saying people shouldn't lay up for retirement and, and have a good retirement to take care of yourself and pay for things. But when people put all of their money and all their efforts into those things here below and forget about God and forget about giving to him and forget about putting God first in their lives, there's the big problem. They're going to be the losers in the end. We've got to be careful of that even ourselves. Well, that's a great verse right there. Notice verse, notice verse 18. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. I may not have much inheritance in this life, but I'll tell you what, I've got one up there with the Lord. That inheritance, God says, lasts forever and ever. Hallelujah. What a wonderful thing that is. Coming on down through here, look at verses number 22 and following, our third big point, enrichment of the righteous. Some more great things God does for the righteous. For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth, they shall be cursed of him that shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Notice if we follow the Lord, God delights in you. God wants to delight in us. He really does. He wants to be happy with us. He wants to say, boy, that person really wants me. That person really wants to please me. That person wants to walk with me and talk with me. I'm going to really come to that person and fellowship with them. You know God's a person. God has feelings. God certainly wants to love us and be with us and talk with us. And a lot of Christians don't give much time. We're too busy with things here below. We can't let him speak to us through his word, and we don't spend much time speaking back to him in prayer. We're the losers. We don't walk and talk with the Lord. That's something we need to be doing constantly. Steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Isn't that great? You might fall, and good men do. David, a man after God's own heart, fell one time. Had a terrible sin, committing adultery with Bathsheba. How sad. A sin that did have consequences in this life, too. But you know what? He repented, got right with the Lord, and God went on to bless him. Kind of amazing, but the son born out of this affair, this adultery with Bathsheba, is Solomon. God chose Solomon to be the one to be on the throne next rather than other children that David had. Isn't that kind of amazing? How God sometimes, when we get right with him, repent and get things going in the right way, God does some amazing things. And so he blessed David in that particular way. Though he fall, he'll not be utterly cast down. The Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young and now I'm old. Here's a great verse. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Now some people say, now wait a minute, God. I've seen some Christian people get so low they've had to beg bread. What do you mean a person won't have to beg bread? Well, let's just put it this way. Some people beg bread because they're not, the first part of that verse, righteous. Well, they, they're saved people. Wait a minute. Just because a person says they're saved people doesn't mean they have the right kind of life. 
Who knows? They might not have honored their parents and still aren't. So God doesn't bless them. Perhaps they won't work. If any man doesn't work, God said in his Bible, neither should he eat. Maybe that's why they're begging bread. I mean, folk, there's a lot more to it than just what meets the eye here. So before you go in and say God's word's wrong, you better check up on what you know about that person. If a person's truly righteous, has lived for God, has done all they can for the Lord, then God's not going to let them be begging bread. He will take care of them. But we better keep that in mind. He's ever merciful, lendeth, and his seed is blessed. Come on down through here. There are some other great things. Notice, if you will, in verse 33, I like this. The Lord will not leave him in his hand nor condemn him when he is judged. That's the wicked again. The wicked sometimes think, <laughs> God's going to take care of me too. I'll be all right in the end. The Bible says we as Christians are where? In the hand of Jesus. I pulled this verse this morning, John 10, 28. What a great verse. It says very plainly there, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. God has the righteous in his hand, not the wicked. They will not be in his hand. That's what these verses are saying. They're going to be lost forever. How sad. What a contrast with the righteous. That's an amazing verse to see there right in that place. But we come down to the final verses of this chapter, and of course we just can't do uh, justice to all these in one sermon. But the end of the righteous contrast with the end of the wicked begins in verse number 32. The wicked watcheth the righteous and seeketh to slay him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand nor condemn him when he's judged. Wait on the Lord and keep his way. He shall exalt thee to inherit the land. There is for the righteous. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. There's for the wicked. I've seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. Yet, here's the end of him, he passed away and lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. The wicked are going to perish. Mark the perfect man and behold the right for the end of that man is peace. God has peace forever for the righteous. But... The transgressor shall be destroyed together. The end of the wicked shall be cut off. By the way, the word destroyed does not mean annihilated. God often says he's going to destroy the wicked. It doesn't mean he annihilates them. It means that he renders them inoperative in this life anymore. The word destruction has that idea in the Hebrew, rendering something inoperative. So in other words, the end of the wicked is not to cease to exist. The end of the wicked is to be winding up inoperative in hell forever. The Bible makes it plain that is their end. So anyway, that's what God's going to do to the wicked, but the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. Hallelujah for that. The Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. What a great verse. The Lord's for us, folk. Don't forget that tonight. He has help, he has strength for you, and the end out there is glorious for us as Christians. The wicked may have it good right now, but don't fret yourself because of them. Don't envy them. Realize what they have is coming to an end shortly, and then what they have forever. Who would I not envy that whatsoever? No. So keep that in mind. A great psalm of contrast here tonight. I hope you'll read it, study it even further than I could comment it on this evening. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time to look at your word, this great psalm of contrast. Lord, may we see tonight it is worth it to be a Christian and live for you. We may not have all the world has. We may be absolutely persecuted by the world. They may hate us. They might try to do us in, but Lord, you're on our side. You'll give us the strength to keep on. If we wait patiently on you, we're going to see a great day coming in the future, a day when we'll be with you, an inheritance uncorruptible and defiled that passes not away, Peter says. You have great things for us in the future compared to what's going to happen to the wicked. So Lord, encourage us tonight to keep on keeping on as your people, to not give up as we look at this world we're in, but keep on trusting you. Oh, how you have great things for us, even now, 
besides what's in the future. Bless now as we remember you in the way you've told us to. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you need a psalm book, I think it's page 293, Break Thou the Bread of Life. We'll have